Okay, why don't we get going? I think we'll have some more folks join us uh, as we get going, but uh, it is noon, so we uh, might as well get started. Um, I am Ryan Mitchell with the Lake Champlain Basin Program. I uh, thank you for joining us today for the Green Infrastructure for Stormwater webinar. Our focus today, as you can see on the screen there, is parking lots and hardscapes. This is the fifth of a six-part um, series on green infrastructure practices. Uh, it is based on the manual um, put together for the Basin Program by um, um, Watershed Consulting Associates and Hirschman Water and Environment, and they're taking the lead on putting these presentations together for us. So we're pleased today to have Laurel Woodward with uh, Hirschman Water and Environment, and also Thomas Baird, who will uh, present some case studies uh, Thomas is with uh, Barton and Ludus, if I'm saying that correctly, hopefully. Um, I will hand it off to Laurel here. If you are having any issues hearing or connecting in any way, shoot me a message on the chat there at the bottom of the go-to meeting window, and we'll do our best to get you squared away. And with that, I will hand it off to Laurel. Thanks, Laurel. Thanks so much, Ryan. Welcome, everyone, to our parking lots and hardscapes session today. If you haven't uh, downloaded the manual, uh, please do. There's a link here that um, you will be able to access once you see the recording of this presentation. This today is, uh, we are looking at a specific chapter within uh, this manual. We've actually been going through the chapters one by one. and. Today is Chapter 4, Parking Lots and Hardscapes. So just to, as an introduction to what's going on in parking lots and what we're worried about, some of the stormwater issues involve just dealing with high volume of runoff. You've got a lot of pavement, a lot of open surface um, with water that needs to get off of that surface in order to not have standing water and in order to avoid problems with traffic and, and safety issues. So one of the challenges, of course, with parking lots is what to do with that water. And traditionally, of course, we've, we've been putting it in catch basins and stormwater pipes. So we're trying to look at a different way to deal with that stormwater runoff with all these green infrastructure practices that we've been talking about in this webinar series. One of the other things that we're trying to do with green infrastructure is deal with our pollutants. So in the parking lot, that would involve heavy metals, hydrocarbons, um, nutrients that are coming, in some cases, from atmospheric deposition onto these surfaces. And in some cases, those nutrients are coming from leaves and other plant matter that might be in the area. Parking lots, especially in commercial areas, are kind of a haven for uh, trash. They uh, tend to be places where people kind of throw trash either out the window as they're leaving or on their way to their cars, and they tend to accumulate along the curbside and eventually get washed away with that stormwater. Curbs also tend to collect leaves and dirt, and in the wintertime, we also find a lot of salt and sand being put down in these parking lots of course, to deal with ice and um, ensure that we have safe walking paths and, and driving aisles. One thing that is often gets overseen as well in parking lots, and this is the same for any, any other dark surface, uh, impervious surface, is high temperature of water. That runoff gets heated very quickly once it hits the pavement, and as it goes down into the drain or um, or into our ditches, it cools down a little bit, but not so much. Uh, it, it ends up, that runoff ends up reaching streams at a much higher temperature than it would in a natural environment. The great thing about green infrastructure is that it's green, and it, it involves usually, in, in most cases, a lot of vegetation. So we have lots of interesting opportunities in parking lots to add landscaping amenities that also have a stormwater management function. That, of course, has an aesthetic value, but in some ways, there's also a, a practical value, especially if you use trees in your green infrastructure practices. 
I don't know if you've been noticing this uh, over the past month or two. I, I've been going to parking lots, tr circling around, circling around, trying to find that shady spot under the tree, and they're all taken. So I, I always appreciate when there's some more options for uh, for shade trees within a parking lot, just to, to have a, a little bit of shady shady haven. Um, one thing that's also <laughs> can be seen as an opportunity, I would say, is that there's a lot of good visibility for green infrastructures uh, practices within a parking lot. This is parking lots are places where people see you know they see the site they they see what you're doing with landscaping on your site and I see this as a benefit because that means that your maintenance crews are going to be more up on main, maintaining those practices uh, versus if your green infrastructure practices were somewhere behind the building or you know somewhere else on the site where you're it's not so visible then it's more likely to get uh, to not get maintained as well some challenges in parking lots include the fact that there's a lot of competing use for the space parking spots are the primary purpose of parking lots and so they, the, the need for parking, uh, the need for wide enough drive aisles for getting in and out of those parking spots um, usually is primary in terms of the design of a parking lot. Uh, but, you know, if, if at the beginning of the design process, green infrastructure is considered in the stormwater management plan, you can work around those needs and um, you know, try to try to build in some space for uh, green infrastructure practices, such as this swale or bioretention system that you see in the picture here. Um, there, another challenge is that in in some cases, those types of green infrastructure practices that are on the surface tend to be kind of long and linear, and depending on sort of the orientation of your parking spaces and the medians within the parking lot, you, you might have a situation where it's hard to get through a swale like the one in the, in the picture or through a bioretention if you're trying to walk from one place in a parking lot to another. So that, that certainly is a challenge, but one that usually can be worked around. Um, so in that design process, it's very important to think about the pedestrian access. And <laughs> I'm going to throw up another picture to exemplify this next thing. Cars can be an issue when it comes to parking lots, where, where parking lots and bioretention meet. This is uh, a rare situation that you'd have a car falling in, but that is a reality that you need to have uh, a hard stop, some good, really good solid curb stop. Um, along the edge of your fire retention systems or your swales so that you don't accidentally have somebody driving into it. The heavy metals that wash in. That's right. That's, <laughs> that's a, one of those heavy metals that uh, tend to pollute our parking lots and our fire retention <laughs> systems. All right. Um, and again, you know, I, I would say I had good visibility as one of the opportunities on the last slide, but of course it's also a challenge because if you aren't maintaining your green infrastructure practices, then it's visible to everybody and a little bit embarrassing. Today I'm going to talk about four different types of green infrastructure practices that are usually appropriate for parking lots and other hardscapes. There are others. Certainly our manual goes into some of those other types of practices, but for time consideration, I'm going to uh, focus on these four. First of all, and one of the most popular ones, especially for retrofitting, is the bioretention system. And here's a cross-sectional drawing of what's in a bioretention system, bio being plants and soil. And then under sort of an, an initial layer of soil is, uh, or even mulch, there's often mulch on the surface of these bioretention systems. Under that, there's a thick layer of soil that usually has a fairly large proportion of sand. And then under that is a layer of stone that helps to hold a lot 
a lot of water. In this particular case, there's also an overflow pipe. And most of them, most bioretention systems are built with an overflow pipe, especially when you're dealing with car traffic nearby. You, you need to have an escape route for um, you know, heavy rains that fill up these practices. So this pipe here that you see, the sand pipe, collects water once it gets to a certain height and then sends it usually to an existing storm drain network. And th the other thing to notice where it says number six is that right there is kind of a cross-sectional view of an underdrain pipe that has little perforated holes. So that allows water to drain out from that, all the water that's kind of saturated that gravel layer down in the bottom will eventually drain out very slowly into the storm drain network. And that serves to drain the entire practice over the course of usually a day or two. And here's a plan view, sort of an overhead view of a bioretention system, where I have that red arrow kind of pointing out that underdrain collection system. They're usually built, um, sometimes it's just one long pipe along the center, and then sometimes, like in this picture, there are some also some that kind of go across the cells. So it, it all just kind of depends on how quickly you need that practice to drain and what the soil is like at that site. Certainly soils that have more clay are going to need a robust underdrain system versus soils that have um, more of that, that till and sandy and glacial till uh, surface or, or a native soil. Those tend to drain better and may not be such, may not need an underdrain system at all. Uh, so that is important to figure out before installing these practices. Here's an example that's featured in our case uh, in our case studies within the manual. This is a parking lot in Plattsburgh, New York. It's at the U.S. Oval site. This was actually a retrofit. Before this bioretention system was built, it was just a big open area. I'm guessing it was probably just mowed grass, and there were very few ut utilities. So it was a perfect place to sort of excavate, bring it down, bring the level down. And in this situation, they actually installed some new catch basins and some new drainage pipes in order to bring the water from the parking lot and from the drive aisle to the site. So na naturally, water was not going to the site. It had to be diverted there. It treats about two and a half acres of, um, of a drainage area. Uh, one and a half of that is impervious. And um, here, you know, one other important feature that they've done really well, I would say, at this site is an inlet that is very well armored with stone. And you'll see here in this picture that it's, um, it's actually, those two inlets are elevated off the bottom of the bioretention system in order to allow for that space below those pipes to pond fully and the water won't back up into the pipes. Rain garden is another term. It's sort of interchangeable with bioretention. In my mind, the difference tends to be that a bioretention system would have an underdrain system whereas a uh, rain garden doesn't necessarily have um, an underdrain pipe or, or maybe doesn't even have any special soil added to the practice. It's primarily a uh, place that's excavated down and then water is allowed to pond in there. And then, of course, plants are added to it that can soak up the water and, and help treat the water. That's what they did here at Mossy Point. It's a boat launch in Ticonderoga, New York. There, at the boat launch, they had um, previous to this particular retrofit and, and a couple others on the site. Runoff from the parking lot was essentially just going down straight into the lake. This is going right into Lake Champlain. So the Warren County Soil and Water Conservation District had identified these, retro these potential retrofits and then got some funding to install them. 
So the conservation district actually did all the designing and led the, con the construction of these practices. And you see in this picture that they're just at the beginning stages of construction. They have installed a stone weir down uh, near the lake at the lower end of the rain garden. That stone weir serves basically both as a dam and an overflow. So when that pond, uh, when that rain garden fills up, it just kind of slowly trickles out through that stone weir. They added uh, native plants. They're, they're all plants that are native to New York. Um, and they did all the excavation themselves. Now, this is what I would call a space saver. Permeable pavement comes in all kinds of shapes and sizes. This particular slide, we're talking about permeable pavers, which are individual blocks that are pieced together, uh, rather than a, uh, a course of you know, asphalt, permeable asphalt or permeable concrete. In this upper left picture, this system of permeable pavers actually comes in. I don't know if you can see kind of in the background, there's a crane that is lowering a mat of these concrete pavers that are actually connected with wires. So they come on a uh, tractor trailer bed and they're installed. They have to be installed with a, cr with a crane. It saves some man hours because you don't have to install the pavers each individually. But under the layer of pavers is first a, a course of about two inches thick of, of a finer, a smaller stone. And that serves to kind of hold back the silt and catch that silt for maintenance purposes so that silt doesn't get further down into the gravel bed. And then it depends on the, the particular design. But in the picture up in the upper left, I believe there was like uh, maybe even two feet of thick gravel. So this is a huge stone reservoir. That that particular parking lot hardly ever has any standing water uh, and has no need for an actual overflow pipe, from what I understand. It all goes down uh, downward vertically. Here's a much simpler <laughs> version of a permeable pavement system. This is, again, at the Mossy Point boat launch. It's actually a level spreader. So if you can imagine uh, kind of a long line uh, of, you, you see how wide it is. Um, but this is kind of all the way across the parking lot. And it serves as kind of a speed bump for the runoff that's coming down the parking lot towards the water. And as the water enters this long, permeable grid system, it, uh, it soaks in a little bit and then kind of some of it goes downward and then some of it trickles down the parking lot towards the lake again. But this is called the grid, grid pave system and it's filled with gravel in between. It was installed by hand. You can see the guys there with a the rake. Fairly, fairly easy to install and um, it does require Sometimes the, the gravel comes out of it as traffic drives over it. So sometimes the, the gravel has to be raked back in. And that they kind of have a routine maintenance system for, for doing that as they do their rounds checking on the boat launches. This is a New York State site, a New York DEC site. Now, on the other hand, uh, this is a permeable asphalt application at Lewis Park in Syracuse, New York. In the picture, you see a little, it's a parking lot next to the park that you can kind of see the gravel that's already put, put down and then the asphalt on top of that. And there's also a basketball court um, that they, they turned into, um, they, they kind of retrofit it turn it into a, a permeable asphalt basketball court. So it's got a little bit of permeable asphalt in, in two places. Maintenance is always important with any of these practices, but especially with permeable pavement. And our, our guest speaker, uh, Tom Baird, today is, is a real expert on permeable pavement. So he will certainly chime in on some of these maintenance needs. 
Vacuum trucks are generally what are used for maintaining these practices to suck up the, any sediment and silt that gets tracked onto the parking lot. And usually th this is done on a very routine basis, perhaps monthly or quarterly, depending on how much traffic you have on the site. This is what happens when you don't maintain permeable pavement. It gets Actually, this, in this picture, there's a, a couple things going on. Uh, it hasn't been vacuumed in a while. It also was put, this permeable grid system was put in a low spot. So it happens to be collecting a lot more sediment than it would have otherwise if it was sort of on the upper edges of, of the parking lot. So that, that's also an important consideration when designing these practices. It's much better to have permeable pavement located in a situation where it doesn't have much run on, um, where it's mostly dealing with the, the water that's landing on it from the sky rather than having to deal with extra water um, next to it. Infiltration practices are a, kind of a general term for either underground or above ground practices that don't necessarily have a bio element. So they don't have plants, they don't have soil, but they do tend to have a lot of stone. And they're, they kind of act like a, just a stone sump for the, a place for the water to go and to collect while it has time to soak into the under, underlying ground. It, you'll see in this the diagram there on the right, there, the differentiation between the two drawings is the upper one is well-drained soils and the lower one is poorly drained soils where you might have a lot of clay. And the primary difference is that the poorly drained soils have an underdrain system. So just like a bioretention cell, these infiltration practices uh, need to be designed really according to what the, the soil is like on the site. Here's an example of an infiltration basin that's along the Dog River in Northfield, Vermont. What you don't see in the picture is that the pretreatment pre practice for this site, or for this practice, is actually a, a hydrodynamic filter. So it's, it's the water from the parking lot goes into a regular catch basin, but inside that catch basin is a type of filter that sort of, it sorts out trash and uh, sediment separates the water from all those pollutants and sends the cleaner water to the infiltration basin. Pretreatment is especially important for infiltration because um, once you build these infiltration basins, it's really hard. It's really hard to get any collected sediment out um, if you don't have pretreatment. If if you spoil and clog that top layer of the infiltration basin, it won't work anymore. Uh, the water will will stand for too much time, and uh, that, that certainly can be a problem. So pretreatment is especially essential for infiltration, but is also important for bioretention systems and some of these other green infrastructure practices. Here's another space saver. Um, this is a, a situation where it's Harwood Union School in Duxbury, Vermont, and they didn't have a whole lot of space to put in some kind of surface level green infrastructure practice. So they decided to deal with their stormwater underground, under the parking lot. From, on the surface, these just look like regular old catch basins in the parking lot. But what's going on underground is that there's these huge, huge tanks they're, I don't know if you call them, well, they're chambers, basically. They're storage, long linear storage chambers, um, not unlike a, a septic system. And they have perforations in the bottom of the cha chambers that allow water to soak into the underlying gravel and eventually down into the soil. <clears throat> the, one of the, <laughs> the really difficult things in a parking lot especially is getting the grading right. By nature, parking lots 
tend to be very flat. And you really, when dealing with stormwater, you have to pay attention to the micrograding of the site to make sure that the water is going to where you need it to go. On the left here, with the frowny face, what what has happened is that um, you know, the, the parking lot was graded towards the bioretention system, but there wasn't enough drop-off, essentially, between the parking lot asphalt and the, the bioretention system. So the elevation was the issue in this, in this situation. The water just kind of got stopped by the grass rather than pouring into it. And then, then on the top right here, you'll notice there's a collection of sediment in the parking lot itself, which ind indicates that water is ponding there and not getting into the practice, whereas it, it should be getting into that, um, that inlet that's right there. Oopsie. <laughs> right here. So, and, and then on the bottom right, here's an inlet to a swale. It's a grass swale. But what happened here is the stone got mounded up so, such that it's actually blocking the curb inlet. So it's much harder for the water to get into that practice. Details matter. You know, I, as a general rule, what you want to try to do is make sure that the flow into the practice is inevitable. So we recommend a two to four inch drop between the edge of the pavement and the the inlet or the the place where you're trying to get the water to go that little elevation difference that two to four inches allows for the what you know is going to happen you know that there's going to be leaves and dirt and sediment collecting at those inlets so having this drop allows enough space for some leaves and some dirt to collect without blocking the curb cut or, or whatever type of inlet you have into the practice. Okay, um, that, com that brings it to the end of my portion of the presentation. Um, I haven't been looking at the chat box to see if there's any questions, um, but it's seeing none. Let me just double check here. I don't think that if you do have any questions, um, I'll just give it a minute here. Feel free to type in. And in the meantime, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. So Ryan introduced Tom a little bit at the beginning. Uh, Tom Baird works with uh, Barton and LeJudis. Uh, he is a licensed professional engineer with this firm. He has actually 26 years of experience in transportation and environmental design for various state agencies and municipalities and also private industry. His experience also includes designing green infrastructure systems, especially porous asphalt and, and other porous materials, which you'll get to hear a lot about today. He's going to be speaking about this really fascinating and multi-spectrum project in Lake George, New York. That is that involves all kinds of different types of green infrastructure practices. So we were really excited to be able to feature it in the manual, and especially excited to have Tom today, who can give you an in-depth review of uh, of that site. All right, Tom, take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Laurel. Um, everybody, see the title screen. Let's go, Tom. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the case study, as Laurel mentioned, and, and you'll see a lot of the items that were uh, mentioned in the previous presentation put into uh, an application and, and into use on this project that was completed in uh, 2015 in Lake George. Um, give you a little bit of a background on it, if you're not familiar with Lake George. Um, it's a stretch along the southern end of the lake as four lanes of traffic, which is Beach Road, which leads into the New York State DEC facility where the what's called the Million Dollar Beach is located. Um, the project was developed into three phases. It was Beach Road, 
um, another phase around of uh, the county road around the parking lot, and then the DEC facility is kind of a phase three. Our firm, we were fortunate enough to be able to uh, work with the different agencies and design all of these projects uh, over a, a five, six year period. Um, one of the largest issues here is that previously all of the drainage that was collected along four lanes of road for approximately a mile uh, and this large facility that it encompasses approximately 10 acres all drained directly into the lake or into uh, various harbors and wetland areas that went uh, that were connected to the lake. Uh, this portion that you see on the screen now is the former uh, million dollar beach setup and parking facility. It uh, used to be a delta for uh, the water bodies that you see up in the left-hand side uh, used to drain right to the lake. Um, some interesting things came up during the construction and design of this project that I'll talk about a little bit later on, going back to that uh, original uh, wetland marsh type delta that was there before. But uh, seeing the existing configuration, um, we have uh, when you do a project such as any project, you typically want to target your pollutants and go, coming along with most parking lot uh, facilities and, and roadways, we have the hydrocarbons, we have um, the heavy metals and pieces of rubber. When the tires wear, uh, where does that wear material go? Well, it goes onto the road, and, and that has picked up who knows what from anywhere you have driven before. Um, and it, it, the heavy metals and contaminants that are in the rubber itself from the manufacturing of the tire. A lot of people may not think of that, but it's a very important part and big, big source of contamination. Um, and of course, sediment and salt. And in this particular project, uh, salt, uh, the porous pavement uh, will help you uh, reduce the amount of salt that needs to be applied. Uh, we didn't actually take any salt out of suspension or out of solution actually from from uh, you know saline water, but um, we have a 50% reduction in salt application that has been done along this stretch for the last four, four or five years, four or five winters actually, which is about 10,000 pounds per year. So um, Lake George being a chloride impaired water body, uh, it really has made a big difference. Um, you know, we first look at the project, we have our, our vegetated swales and, and different types of uh, parking unit, parking uh, facility practices. Um, we did incorporate some of this uh, in, these, in the project. We're very tight with real estate here um, and the number of parking. Uh, rain gardens, we do have these typical practices stormwater planners, um, et cetera. Um, one of the things we weren't able to do uh, here not practical were green roofs. Uh, sometimes they can really get carried away. And I can't hear anybody laugh, but I hope you're all laughing a little bit. Um, maintenance uh, being one of the issues with green roofs as well, although there are creative ways uh, to, to get that uh, get that done. Um, one thing Laurel mentioned too, soils. And soils are very important. And this picture from the 50s, uh, was prior to the Beach Road being constructed uh, and most of the uh, DEC facility. And one of the things that I noticed, if you can see my pointer, is we've got cobbly based soil uh, that's here and that's what's being used to fill in the lake uh, to create these facilities to begin with. So we had a good idea that we had good soils to deal with because they were imported and uh, likely had peat and very high organic content material deeply below, but we had a good base of material to use. And, um, our coring and infiltration tests confirmed that this type of material was present. So although being right next to a lake and, and uh, um, you know, not we had materials there that were very useful for doing the construction to handle the type of loadings that we would have. So again, soils are very, very important from a number of different angles. Um, so getting on to the Million Dollar Beach facility, which essentially is a uh, 350 parking lot facility. Um, it was completely uh, redesigned, and uh, a lot of the issues they had there was access, uh, vehicles waiting in line, um, the elevation of the facility. Um, in my cursor here, uh, this area, the main area, was uh, about four feet lower than the actual beach house uh, where you get access to the beach. Um, this is a boat uh, launch facility that was limited by a bridge. Uh, there was a big issue here with um, the boats getting in because it was so shallow, churning up the sediment that was there, making very large plumes during the, the boating season. Um, all of the, this road around this loop road here was uh, developed as part of phase two as a porous road. Um, this is the end of the uh, first project with, with Beach Road, and the limits here 
uh, for the DEC project. Um, in its current configuration post-project, um, one of the main things uh, is a, a roundabout, um, which previously traffic would travel around the facility and travel with two lanes directly in front of the beach house where people would walk from the parking lot and have to cross over two lanes of traffic. Um, oops, sorry about that. In order to uh, you know, reduce that conflict with pedestrians, we utilize a roundabout here so people driving through to make a U-turn to go back and cruise the village would just make the U-turn here at the roundabout and head back to where they want to go. Uh, we also eliminated that traffic flow in front of the uh, the bathhouse by making this road here, Loop Road Two Ways, a two-way road, which allowed us to have no conflicts with uh, with traffic once you're inside the facility. So the, the project was a, an environmental uh, demonstration project for New York State DEC, but it was also a, a traffic and pedestrian safety improvement project as well. And uh, we're lucky to actually win a few awards on environmental merit and transportation uh, merit for this particular project, those two elements. Uh, working together. So uh, real quick, uh, the area I'm circling here is porous asphalt. Uh, we've got infiltration swales around around the end, rain gardens and underground systems, uh, some hydrodynamic separators. Uh, but overall, the, the uh, new facility became 50% impervious from the original 94% impervious before the project was built. Um, the original uh, parking lot you can see here uh, puddled uh, it was much lower than it is. This whole area will be raised, and I'll show you a few pictures of that. Um, the boat launch here, uh, just a sea of asphalt. And one of the most important things is that the whole parking lot was sinking. Um, these areas that are highlighted here in the, in the colors are areas that uh, there were stones or boulders underneath where the parking lot didn't sink. So every few years, they have to come back and overlay it with asphalt just to put another heavy heavy load on top of it to make it sink even more. So it was a losing battle, and something had to be done to actually make the, the facility uh, sustainable. So, so one of the first things that, that we did was uh, is design uh, the parking lot to strip off all the old asphalt and raise the entire area three feet to five feet in height. Um, using a reservoir stone system for uh, instead of typical highway DOT type subbase material, um, it's a 40% to 45% air void stone. And if you do that math, it with 5% to 10% air voids in typical subbase, you can reduce your loading by approximately 30% just by the stone materials, uh, changing materials into having stone with a lot higher air void ratio. So we used the stone material, both under porous and non-porous asphalt, for the help of that weight reduction. Uh, fabrics and, and different types of uh, uh, ge geosynthetics were also used underneath the stone to help with the load carrying capacity. Um, soil borings, we did have soil data, and we knew uh, what kind of loading and everything could handle with vehicles parked on it, and, and we were in good shape. Uh, but using this type of stone, which was anywhere from uh, 2 to 5 feet thick, uh, really was a big help because of the, the reduction in weight that it has. Just a few more photos, and I'll just show you the contrast and difference. This was the original uh, two-lane road that went right in front of the bathhouse on the right. Um, and you can see the elevation difference. You used to have to walk up a ramp holding onto a railing to get from the parking lot into the, the, the bathhouse here, which was not exactly ADA compatible. In fact, it wasn't ADA compatible. So uh, by bringing the parking lot up as we did, um, it, it helped to provide a, a nice smooth transition with a minimal grade for uh, people with all types of abilities and mobility able to uh, get to the bathhouse a little bit easier. So this photo is just a contrast of before and after um, in, in the raising that we did of the whole facility. What you're looking at too is a porous asphalt uh, binder course uh, before the top course is put on. Um, and, and that's a, a view basically from the same thing. It's just kind of the same picture. Uh, the boat launch used to be right here, which you can see was a bridge uh, before the bathhouse. And that is gone, and the boat launch was constructed on the other side of the, of the facility where we had deeper water to help minimize uh, disturbance when the boats enter the water. But this is all uh, top course porous asphalt here. A total of three acres of porous asphalt was on just this DEC facility project. 
Um, when you get into porous asphalt, one of the things I like to talk about, we just don't have a lot of time here for that, is to, the protection of your resource, protection of the porous asphalt. Um, one of uh, Laurel's photographs before was that uh, previous, previous area that was right at a low point in drainage that was clogged up. Um, this is something you, you want to protect against a lot when you have porous asphalt. And it's a little hard to see, but it looks like there's a little bit of a, of a bend or a break in this yellow line in the crosswalk. Well, if you look a little closer where the stripes are, you can see a slightly different color in asphalt. That section uh, that my arrow is on and by the striping is actually conventional asphalt. And on this side, where it's darker, is porous asphalt. What that distortion you see is actually a, a, a break in slope. We actually have uh, all of the uh, conventional pavement sloped away from the porous and the porous sloped back onto itself. Um, this is a, a, a protection that you don't have... Uh, contaminated materials coming from the non-porous uh, area and flowing into the porous area. So little little things like that go a long way in, in protecting your, your, your project, protecting the resource, and cuts down on the maintenance and potential clogging. So think about that when you're doing the, your design is where is the off-site water going to go to? And any water that flows onto porous asphalt from another area is considered off-site water, um, making the porous section pretty much your confined site. You know, not a site, overall site, but uh, in that philosophy, you can help protect uh, protect what you have. Um, again, uh, this is where those two lanes of traffic were before. We've got rain gardens in here with planting beds and mulches. All of the hard surfaces here drain either left or right. Uh, the grass is a little sparse. This was the first growing season, uh, so don't don't pay too, too much attention to that. But you can see on the on the right the conventional pavement. These were parking spaces uh, primarily for uh, uh, handicap accessibility, and we expect a high turnover rate in these parking spaces. So they were constructed with uh, conventional asphalt um, because the primary use of this facility is during the summertime, and we did have ways to treat the water from from this area as well in an infiltrating way. So a little bit of a before. You can see the elevation change in, in the road, and, and that's what it looks like now. So for the mobility aspect, uh, the functionality of the site being significantly improved, um, as well as the environmental, um, that's why it was a, a pretty much a good win-win project for uh, New York State DEC. Um, just another photo. All right, we talked a little bit about protection, and I'll, I'll harp on the porous pavement right now. Um, this wall here, shown on the right, was constructed for, for many reasons. Um, to control access to the beach, of course, but a sand break uh, for the, uh, the windblown sand that comes off the lake. Um, aesthetics, of course, but also to limit access to the lake for snowmobilers. In the wintertime, uh, Lake George's uh, have a lot of snowmobilers there. It's, it's, it's a great thing to do. But we also have to minimize and limit their access to the lake. We don't want the carbide treads of uh, the snowmobiles going over porous asphalt. Uh, it doesn't uh, work, it doesn't end too well for the pavement, if you know what I mean. So with the wall on the left, you can see the sand. And, uh, and we put this wall through to help initially block windblown sand coming off the lake and getting over onto the porous asphalt. Um, the second part of it is in the design of uh, the pavement systems just to the left of this photo is is uh, is the beach. Um, this is conventional pavement, being the the bus and drop off lane. Uh, but to the right, uh, in be on the other side of the curb is where the porous asphalt will be. So we created this elevation difference uh, using curbs to create a sand trap for any sand that gets past uh, the veg the wall and then the vegetation and then uh, two different curb lines. So when the wind blows blows up, it drops off and drains back, falls back onto the conventional pavement. Um, kind of a finished view. Here you have the wall on the right. You have this vegetated area. Uh, anything that gets past that comes up to the curb, comes across to the curb. If it gets blown, hopefully it drops out when the wind velocity drops off and it comes back down with the rain. Porous asphalt on the right, conventional on the left. So. Um, before this project was constructed, windblown sand would, would go and cross the entire site uh, from the beach. Um, it was a big problem in clogging drainage structures uh, that were originally part of the, the uh, part of the original design. 
So protect your assets. Uh, everything goes for every practice, but uh, poor SAS full, um, you do have uh, a lot to a uh, lot to think about because it is a lot more susceptible and certainly not as easy to clean once it becomes clogged. All right, um, some of the stormwater practices that were used on the project, uh, the infiltration chambers, rain gardens, by retention, and, and, and others. Um, I'm going to go over a few of those and how they were put into place here. Um, the roundabout on the left-hand side, uh, that is a vegetated, uh, kind of a bioretention rain garden hybrid, but um, anything that drained from the roundabout, which on the roundabout circle here would drain into the center, didn't take a lot of drainage because the roundabout pavement itself drains the opposite direction. So not a, not a big system in here, but everything gets pretreated and then falls into an infiltration sand bed area with an overflow of uh, with an overflow catch basin that would direct it uh, to another practice. But all of these uh, all the vegetation along this edge here. Uh, which goes around the parking lot is a vegetated infiltration swale, which you won't find in uh, the New York State DEC manual. Hopefully, the next iteration will will have it in, have it included. But it's a sand and topsoil mixture of uh, of soil that's uh, reasonably uh, practical to get in in, uh, in the New York area. Uh, that um, has an underdrain at the bottom of it uh, that takes in and uh, allows the water water to infiltrate whatever is not used up by the vegetation above. Um, so a little bit of a, of a graphic here. Um, the two areas, circle and red, uh, utilize the underground infiltration storm chambers. Uh, all of the uh, conventional asphalt is shown here in gray, uh, the light gray. All of that is collected and makes its way to uh, either the first infiltration chamber here um, into the, the roundabout center or along the edges of the rain gardens. And then there are also catch basins that are directed to a hydrodynamic separator as a pretreatment filter for the underground storm chambers you see here. So uh, a drop of water literally could be treated in, uh, and go through at least four different, go through four different practices before it actually uh, goes back into the water table, uh, depending on where that lucky or maybe unlucky uh, raindrop actually lands. So um, with these systems, we were able to build it under 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 on top of the stone layer, and it, uh, the overflow from this actually uh, ends up into an underdrain that runs across the entire uh, southern end of the parking lot, uh, eventually into a uh, basin that outlets to a uh, wetland. So um, pretty comprehensive system here, but lots of uh, belts and suspenders as well. Um, around the perimeter, all of these green areas, uh, the pavement is uh, graded to drain towards them. Um, not as big of a deal in, in the dark gray area here, the, that is the actual porous asphalt section, um, but it's put in as a backup system uh, to have this uh, filter system uh, along the edge, and I have a detail of this coming up soon. But um, all of this water uh, is, is, is treated. Whatever doesn't get caught here, this is the uh, where the trailers and boats would park. Bull Park, and this is the invasive species washing station. Um, but we have backup systems in a vegetated swale system like that. So uh, this is what it looks like kind of during construction. You'll see a, a, uh, a lip here with the curb. Um, this is the porous asphalt uh, binder base course with the top still to come on. Um, once the top was put on on this side, on the beach side, and this is a good shot of the road, which was done the year before, the curb is flush. Um, and the pavement run, the water that runs from this porous asphalt here, if it actually you get a heavy storm in it or there's some clogging over time, uh, this is the backup system for the porous asphalt on both the roadside and the parking lot side with a flush curb. You need to have a lateral support on your, on your porous asphalt when you have them on roadways or at the edges of parking lots. It will push out. Uh, the air voids in the base course are at 25%. Um, over time, they will not hold together without some type of lateral support. So a concrete or um, granite, in this case, curb uh, put in as lateral support, uh, you really need to do that. Make sure that's on the projects that you review. Um, for the larger storms and for backup to the infiltration trenches, uh, there's a hydrodynamic separator here, which outlets eventually to Snug Harbor here, which is a, a wetland and, and a tributary area to the lake itself. Um, there's a little picture to the left, but uh, the interesting thing about these is, uh, is it's a downstream defender, and the reason why these were 
are used as one. They work very well, but with the high water table and low uh, short elevation that we had to work with here, the downstream defender will enter at a lower elevation than it exits. It's pushed by uh, by headwater um, and and hydrostatic pressure, so you don't have to worry so much about uh, large grade differences. Um, they work very well when you have a, a tight tight constraints like that. Um, coatings, I'll go real quick. Uh, paint chips, powder coating. Everybody knows paint and powder coating. They don't chip and they don't flake off to make rust. So I'm being sarcastic there, but we developed a, uh, a work working agreement with a, a company that called Linex uh, that makes truck truck bed um, uh, coatings that you spray on. You can literally throw rocks on them, hit it with hammers, and we coated all of the metal parts of this project. The New York State DEC allowed us to uh, create a special specification and process to allow this type of material. And one of the demonstrations that I did was take a hammer. I banged on this freshly, this brand new bench in front of the DEC commissioner, and he almost, you know, he almost yelled at me. But I said, "Look, there's really not an issue at all. Everything is holding up fine." So all the bike racks, the the gates, and the benches are made with this material. And this is an area where I hit with a hammer, um, and you can see there's no chipping. So we don't get the paint chips into the water. A lot of people don't think about that, but it's a, it's a big problem. Um, all right, auxiliary parking area. Um, originally, this is how it looked. Uh, lots of sand. Uh, this is where uh, snowmobilers would stage uh, for the wintertime activities and a lot of overflow parking uh, for the facility. But um, the DEC wanted to improve it. So uh, part of the project was to expand this auxiliary lot and uh, add a ticket booth in. Um, this was conventional asphalt. And the primary reason is because in the wintertime, uh, there's a lot of, uh, in the springtime, a lot of runoff from the adjoining uh, high embankments on the on the right side in the picture here, kind of where that truck is, that would put a lot of sand and pine needles. Um, the tree leaves, pine needles especially, are not very controllable here. There's a lot of wind, and it just wasn't practical. So we built this section with the 40% air void stone uh, to limit any kind of frost heaves. Uh, we also developed um, a swale along the entire edge here. This entire area that's blanketed with uh, uh, turf reinforcement mats is infiltrating soil with a 80% sand, 20% topsoil mix. Um, which Tom, I just want to let you know where. Hey, Tom, we're, I just want to let you know we're at about the five-minute mark. Okay, good. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, good. Uh, we're, Everything drains this way, is infiltrated here, and then whatever doesn't infiltrate uh, flows over with a sheet flow uh, all about uh, 50 feet to the wetland. So we have a couple different ways uh, that we treat water here, at least uh, the best that we can for this project. Um, so invasive species boat washing station, um, Asian clams, lots of issues with Lake George, both coming in and coming out. So uh, for this thing, for this part of the project was very important because as part of the DEC's uh, uh, thoughts are we really have to protect the lake. There's so much that comes in, so much that comes out, but they also and they want to stop the spread of it coming out as well. So how are we going to develop this? So we came up with a raised platform system that uses precast porous concrete panels that can be removed. Um, it's raised slightly, so it's very prominent. Uh, the boats get washed and checked on their way in. And then they also get checked on their way out, washed if they, they need to be, and any kind of plants, plants or clams or mussels or anything that's attached can get removed. So a big, a big improvement in protecting not only Lake George, but other lakes as well. Um, in about 10 to 15 years, these panels will be, can be removed. There's stainless steel inserts being picked right out, and the sand filter underneath that was constructed can be removed, replaced, or even just the top layer skimmed off. Um, we anticipate, as I said, 10 to 15 years to have this done, um, and then simply plate replaced back in. The panels can be removed and power washed at any particular time if they're not vacuumed. Um, just a little bit of construction photos here. So it's something a little bit novel. I understand this design is is, is starting to be repeated around uh, part, some of the New York State lakes as well. Uh, just a close-up of it. Um, boat launch, real quick. Uh, Slabs are built. They're pushed in on tracks. And I don't know if anybody's seen the boat launch pushed in before, but it required three dozers uh, to get the slab moving. 
Um, had to build up an embankment to help gravity to get it done. But, uh, you know, that's how the new boat launch came about, and that's how it looks today. Um, think, comparing with the old boat launch here, um, we're in deeper water and a lot, a lot uh, more efficient, environmentally friendly way of getting the boats into the water. Um, big part of the project uh, is working out very well. Environmental challenges, uh, there was a, a, a dig site that was about 400 feet long that this spear point was uh, is approximately 8,000 years old, was found um, at the first four inches of uh, grass and down below almost indefinitely there were artifacts found in every shovelful. And uh, just a little picture, this was a fish drying operation that was found from about the 14, 1500s they estimated. But it all came from uh, this section right here where this arrow is. Now the Million Dollar Beach facility is here in this delta. Um, this was kind of a supermarket or a, a location where all of uh, uh, hunting and food preparation was, was done. And that's the exact area uh, that we had uh, that where the excavation was done and all these artifacts were found. And they actually got to a point where they stopped digging because it was every shovel full had a lot. Um, so we had to build a road that wouldn't crush the artifacts uh, in there. How do you do that? Well. We used, again, uh, porous asphalt reservoir stone for lightweight geotextiles and elevated the road in a specific fashion in a construction methods so that we would um, build, build going forward and then uh, um, build the roads to the left and the right as the, the center section was done. It's a lot of information here, but um, we utilized the porous asphalt technology in helping preserve artifacts. Federal Highway Administration, State Historic Preservation Officers, they love the idea. They're actually using this nationwide now um, with this setup. Um, we had calculated all the loads of the construction equipment and so forth. It turns out that uh, the loads of the bulldozers ended up being less than it was for the vehicle tires that used to be traveling over top of this area you know, and how it was set up. So um, that concludes what I have for now. There, I have a uh, two-hour version of this as well. I, you know, I, I uh, certainly appreciate everybody's time here, and I hope I didn't go too fast. But if uh, anybody has any questions, um, I'm ready for those. Great. That's wonderful, Tom. It's a really fascinating site that you had a chance to work on. I hadn't even thought about the sand blowing up from the beach. Um, I'm just looking at the chat box. Uh, if, if anybody does have questions for Tom, now is the time to, uh, to throw them into the chat box there. Um, in the meantime, I wanted to ask you, Tom, um, how did you how did you ensure that the final grading worked out? Because it sounded like you it, that was it had to be very precise where there was a break between porous asphalt and conventional and and dealing with the the sand break and all that during construction. How did you ensure that it worked out? Yeah, we we had a uh, full time inspector uh, resident engineer on site for the entire project. Uh, we also had uh, site visits. I was there for the entire uh, paving operations. Um, we, the contractor uh, used uh, GPS and uh, we had a surveyor on site to make sure every grade and elevation shot was, was made. And a lot of times on smaller projects uh, that, doesn't, uh, that doesn't pan out because it is, it is expensive uh, to have that. Um, we graded the we graded everything very precisely. The whole lot grades at 0.7 percent away from the beach. Uh, you know those are the, those are the things. Um, but wow. it's oversight oversight and uh, and monitoring and being involved for the from day one to the end uh, that really does that. So okay. I see a question here from Sal. Uh, looks like Sal Christie. How does the porous asphalt influence the snow in the winter? Can you plow? Um, porous asphalt, uh, not a problem in the winter at all. You can plow directly over top of it. Uh, we recommend that the plow drivers just have their blades angled. Um, you can plow it, um, no problem at all. Um, I've seen it done. The beach road has been plowed through four winters now. Uh, there's still not a mark in the pavement. Uh, and uh, for this parking lot, it's just two years now, and they only plow half of it in the wintertime, but uh, not a problem at all. Hey, Tom, this is Dave Hirschman. I'm here with Laurel. Uh, on that topic of ice and snow, uh, one of the things the University of New Hampshire has said uh, on, the, on this type of porous material is that the, 
the stone, the deep stone reservoir, kind of a thermal mass, and you actually get less ice buildup and quicker snow melt. Have you guys uh, experienced that or witnessed that phenomenon? Yes. Um, some of the uh, testing that was done um, in uh, in Maine uh, showed uh, with temperature probes in, in the system uh, an increase in temperature as you went down uh, got lower in the system. Um, it, it retains the heat. Uh, it's a very large insulator. Um, one of uh, one of the reasons why porous asphalt takes so long and is so difficult to install on a, on a warm day is because it holds the heat so well. Um, this repeats itself all the way down through the matrix, kind of like air is really the insulator in the walls on your home. Um, in, in between the strands of fiberglass, it works the same here. Uh, we have had no freezing or anything of any sort at, at any time. Um, some of those tests showed 14 degrees in uh, surface temperature and 32 degrees a foot and a half down. Yeah, interesting. Uh, another question, since this project has gone in, has the, have, have they learned any key lessons about maintenance of these systems? Yeah. Uh, one, of the, one of the things is the vacuuming. Um, it, it, it really is imperative. If you can't be confident that your client or the project owner is going to vacuum the facility, you might want to think of coming up, coming up with a different plan. Um, two to three times a year is really optimal. If uh, New York State DEC had purchased their own vacuum truck, and it's not sweeping, um, it needs to be vacuum only. Sweeping with a brush will just cause the particles to get smaller and get trapped even more. Uh, so that the vacuuming part is very very important. Yeah, great. Um, that that reinforces what we all say about stormwater is maintenance is important. Um, and and finally, Tom, price tag. I'm sure a lot of people are wondering uh, and what the funding mechanism was for the project. Mm -hmm. um, for the initial project, Beach Road, we received money from. Uh, New York State Environmental Facilities Corporation, a, a half a million grant, half a million dollar grant to pay the extra, the cost of the extra cost for the porous asphalt. Um, environment, uh, the EPA is very much behind it. The funding from New York State and New York State Environmental Facilities comes through the EPA. Um, New York State DEC uh, was more or less, well, we've got this great beach road project on either both sides of us. We really uh, should should uh, add to it, and, and uh, they funded the entire project themselves. Um, that project you saw right there was ended up being with engineering oversight and uh, design and all that about seven million dollars, which was funded entirely by New York State DEC. Yeah, um, porous asphalt. Can, yeah, porous asphalt can cost you about fourteen dollars a square foot compared to conventional asphalt at eight to ten. Um, but if you do not have to put in the infrastructure uh, for the drainage structures and all of, the, all of that, it's, it becomes the same price. Um, the traction is uh, porous asphalt when it's wet only loses 25% of its friction compared to regular, which uses, loses 75%. So we're using it on multi-use paths and trails and in areas that are slippery when wet um, as uh, part of mitigation for slip and falls as well. Um, yeah. I have a test section with Kevlar fiber reinforcement right now uh, that we're working on using, uh, making even higher strength uh, porous asphalts coming up in the f very near future. Yeah. Yeah, I guess on, on the cost comparison too, if you if you just had conventional asphalt and the whole thing and then had to do surface treatment for stormwater, that would take up a whole lot more land. Try to do that. Yes. Obviously, land cost. Anyway, I know Laurel here has got a couple last slides, so I will turn it back over to her. I just want to say, you know, Tom is a great case study, and your explanations were clean and clear and compelling, three Cs. So uh, thank you very much. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Great. Well, thanks, Dave and Tom. Just to wrap up, since we're at the 1 o'clock hour, we do have one last uh, in the series of webinars, July 13th. So we're skipping a week because of the holiday next week. But the following week on July 13th from 12 to 1, we will 
be talking about the building environment and, and how you can involve green infrastructure on uh, above and around buildings. Again, you can register for these webinars at the lcbp.org website. And you can see there, there's a little link there at the bottom uh, on the screen. And I wanted to also mention again that these are all recorded. So if you've got colleagues that you think might make use of these webinars, that would be wonderful if you would send them to this website, lcbp.org, and show them the links to the, the videos. And they're all on YouTube as well. I want to thank everybody who came today and looking forward to seeing you at another one of these webinars. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you, Laurel. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, everybody.